Greetings, my dear friends. This is Chax once again simplifying a new area for all of you. This time we will continue with the Middle East and talk a little more in detail about Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, the name is synonymous with oil and Mecca and Medina, the two of the holiest cities for Muslims. If you recollect, in, a, in my previous episode, we had spoken about the origins of Saudi Arabia and how the fall of the Ottoman Empire set the stage for the House of Saud to consolidate and become an independent country as and recognized in 1932 as Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is home to about 40 million people. 2.15 lakh square kilometers in area, a GDP just under 700,000 million, but only 1.6% of the area is fit for cultivation. It occupies the majority of this Arabian Peninsula and is bounded by Jordan, Iraq, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, UAE, Oman and Yemen. Desert is the most distinguishable feature of Saudi Arabia. It has three major deserts. The Al Nafud in the north, Al Dana in the east, and Rab Al Khali in the south. Therefore, the major geographical, geopolitical challenge as far as Saudi Arabia is concerned comes from its geography. As sparsely populated country and since it is most known for oil and oil is the mainstay of its economy, it has to keep the shipping lanes open, especially in the Straits or Ormuz. The vast desert in some ways isolate the central Nuts plateau which is the core of Saudi Arabia with its capital Riyadh. Mecca and Medina, two of their holiest cities, are further to the west and are protected by mountains and flanked by the Red Sea. The security of these two cities is the key to monarchy's legitimacy and leadership of the Islamic world. Oil and natural gas, the major exports and the source of wealth since the discovery in 1938 creates its own issues, especially when most of the oil and gas is on the eastern province and that is where the population is not too happy with the House of South. This makes Saudi Arabia vulnerable to an economic squeeze in case the shipping lines are constricted and cross-border ties expose the kingdom to unrest, especially in the south across Yemen. Now you realize the importance of Yemen as far as Saudi Arabia is concerned. To keep this shipping lanes open, Saudi Arabia does not have a major navy of its own. Therefore, it is dependent on the NATO countries, especially the United States to keep its shipping lanes open. Geography really has played tyranny as far as the House of South is concerned. So let's take geography a little bit more in detail. On the eastern desert, the Al Hassa is oil rich, but oil is a little difficult to extract basically because of the shifting sands and lack of people. To complicate issues, this area has predominantly Shias and they are amenable to influence from Iran. On the west, the Hejaz Islands are broadly more hospitable. Most of the population resides here within 150 odd kilometers from the sea. Jeddah, Mecca, Taif are the most the most populated corridor here 
and a significant part of the population is concentrated on the south bordering Yemen. I just mentioned a while back, Yemen is important to the Saudis. Sadly, again for the Saudis, this border, southern border, is again dominated by Shias. There are hardly any ports here. The ports are in their infancy and therefore, despite having proximity to a major shipping lane across the Red Sea, it cannot really use that. Jeddah is the biggest port in this part. The central highlands, the Najd region, is isolated both from the east and the west. The Al Ruma Valley connects Medina to the east, that is to the Persian Gulf. And because of its isolation, the people living here are essentially Wahhabi and have an isolationist tendencies. Therefore, you can broadly see you have a Najd region, isolated, conservative ideology of Wahhabism, the Hijaz on the west is more cosmopolitan because here people have had interactions with other communities, other countries and the Al Hassa on the east is dominated by Shias and expats basically because there is oil and oil has its own industry. The major sea routes are both on the east and the west. The western sea route which is across the Red Sea, well not much used essentially because no major ports in that side and has a choke point at the south at the Gulf of Yemen and on the north with the Suez Canal. On the west, on the east you have the Persian Gulf and the Straits of Hormuz which ensures most of the oil and gas is shipped across but the, Gulf, the Iran can choke the Straits of Hormuz. Therefore, the importance of freedom of navigation and the importance of the US. Saudi Arabia is an oil rich country. Oil is central to over 90% of the economy. However, the price of oil is something that rose and fell and fell and fell till it is now stabilized between 50 and 60 dollars. Saudi Arabia has a budgetary deficit of approximately 20 percent. Their sovereign wealth fund which was 730 billion dollars just four years back in 2015 is dropped less than 500 billion in the early 2019. To satisfy and keep the restive population under check, it has already committed to a $100 billion social spending. Therefore, a matter of few years in Saudi Arabia would run out of its money. Hence, economic reform are an important geopolitical need. How do they get this money? Well, they have a few sources. One of them is Mecca Medina because they are the holiest cities as far as the Muslims are concerned and tourism accounts for approximately $20 billion annually. The eastern al Asa region has a significant number of Shias and so does the southern border on the western side. Therefore, Iran has a role out here. Or so Iran imagines. The population of Saudi Arabia is predominantly Sunni, which is approximately 35%. 25% are Wahhabis. About 15 to 17% are Shias, and they sadly are considered second-rate citizens. The expat workers, especially from Asia, account for about 20% of the population, but occupy about 80% 
of positions in the private sector, they are worse off than Shias. The local population is used to working in high paying public sector and therefore are not willing to work hard to toil in labor intensive areas and the minorities are vulnerable to outside influence. This part was brought home very, very clearly by the rest of eastern population of the Shias who got enamored by the Arab Spring. The Saudi authorities cracked down on the dissidents and increased social spending. Typical carrot and stick. The low oil prices have aggravated the problem and like I said a few minutes back, the budgetary deficit is phenomenal. To add to this, over 60% of Saudi population is under 25 years. Therefore, in the coming years, the working adults will surge. Increased spending, oil revenue coming down, the public sector inefficient but employs a large number of Saudi locals. Therefore, a cauldron of disquiet and therefore the need for reform, the need for change. And this change was enunciated as a document called Vision 2030. The Vision 2030 was unveiled on the 25th of April 2016 by the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. There are three main pillars here. One, to ensure Saudi Arabia remains at the heart of the Arab and Islamic worlds. No surprises there, right? A determination of Saudi Arabia to become the global investment powerhouse. And third, to transform the, the country's location and, sorry, utilize the country's location and transform into a hub connecting the three continents of Asia, Europe, and Africa. Obviously, this will mean a lowering of dependence on oil, diversification of, the, of tourism, of industry, from health, education, infrastructure, recreation, and tourism. Towards that, they announced 80 major projects to be completed by 2030, mostly to be, to be financed by the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia. Where is the money? The money is exactly the problem. Vision 2030 remains a hard sell. They have not really been able to push it forward especially because of the new risks that have come in along with the confrontation with Iran and now you'll start understanding why Saudi Arabia is not confronting Iran because if it confronts Iran the mission vision 2030 is in jeopardy. Iran has shown a readiness to strike whether it is closure of the Straits of Hormuz or it is striking at the oil infrastructure inside Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is also an authoritarian state. Its record on human rights is not much to write home about and the Khashoggi issue brings it home to home and therefore Saudi Arabia is in trouble. What then, what then is the future? You can straight away see two or three things that are happening and those things are very clearly evident. One, an oil dependent economy needs to diversify. A restive population, especially the Shias, right, difficult. The importance of keeping trade routes open, well, no capacity of its own. There are new players emerging, while on one hand, US is reducing its dependence on oil and today has enough oil reserves of its own, right? 
but others from Asia, especially China, Japan, India, are rising in their importance. There are new alliances forming. The need of diversification of oil economy, the need for security of the shipping lanes highlights the need for India. No wonder Salman, Mohammed bin Salman has been rushing to India and signing a plethora of agreements and pandering to India very significantly. Right? The dependence on US, if it has to reduce, then they have to improve, increase their dependence on the Asian countries. One of the methods the US, the Saudis have found to be effective is an interventionist policy to hit at the problem outside their own shores and therefore you will find them intervening everywhere, whether it was Doha, it was Tripoli, Iraq and Yemen. And the, and the Doha or Qatar, they have tried to subjugate the kingdom on one hand. In Yemen, they have tried to do it militarily. Well, they are also the receiving end from Iran. And therefore, dear friends, we live in interesting times. As always, I look forward to your comments, your suggestions. And of course, do share, like my video. Thank you very much and have a great day. Sadra Khanam.